All right, so the first, you know, number one there was to create the master page. I would strongly recommend, now, I, you know, you would say, why didn't you tell us this when we, before we started? Well, maybe I should have. I don't know. But what I did was um, I, I kept open the original, your last test, so test number two, plus I opened up the practice exercise nine we did in class and the practice exercise ten we did in class. And I had, I literally had four instances of um, Visual Studio open. So the first thing I did was I made a copy of test two and put it into test three, okay? And then I opened up those other ones. Now, I, as far as I could tell, no one had a problem with um, creating the master page. No one had a problem with renaming. One thing you have to remember is when you rename, some of you renamed your pages and you did it fine. But on your redirects, you've got to, re you've got to rename it there too. Because if you don't, you're going to call a page that no longer exists. All right? And a couple of you did that, or you had a problem where you didn't close tags. Remember that you wanted to, to, to grab and literally throw everything out, so to speak, that you had on the original page up until like your H whatever tag. All right? Some of you didn't do that. So, all right. Convert the current pages in the site. I just told you that. Create the new page. What I did with mine was literally I went over to this page from Chapter 9, took everything that was in here, right there, and all of that, including the contact information, copied that, you know, and the buttons, copied it to the new page. It's the first thing I did. Then I said, okay, um, what do I have to change? What do I have to add, etc.? Well, first thing was, was the ads. At least one of you left off the Social Security number field. Well, you lost points if you left that field off, okay? And um, then, you know, for a social security number, you needed the required field, plus you needed to be in the right format, et cetera. So we already had that one in here. So, I, again, I just copied this, and I used that for the social security number and changed the pattern, and I did the same thing for the zip code. You know, the idea was, you know, part of being able to do this and be successful with it is to do as much, as much new work, or I'm sorry, as little new work and as much as you can and as much rework as you can. All right. A lot of you added a theme, which was fine. All right. Um, I don't believe anybody, maybe I'm wrong, I don't think anybody did the breadcrumbs. All right. I don't think anybody did the alert. Again, I could be wrong on that. I don't really remember. But um, the funny thing is that with the alert, if you just went out to W3 schools and you you know you you went into their Bootstrap tutorial and put uh, you know put Bootstrap alert, you could have literally copied the code right out of there. You didn't have to make it dismissible where it had an X on it. You didn't have to do any of that. I tried to keep it real simple. All right. So. I was kind of surprised that nobody did that, but nobody did that, so that's fine. So again, I, I wanted to show you a couple things. You know, you might look at mine, and I'm going to explain to you a couple things too. That, and and after I do, you might actually get not mad, but me, well, perturbed maybe, and say, "Well, that isn't fair. You didn't tell us that in class." I'm not even going to disagree with you. But there's a, a couple things I wanted to mention before I pass these back, and I wanted to do it and make sure that um, I wanted to make sure that, that people saw, for lack of better words, what I did and hopefully you could see why I did it. Now one thing is, I want you to understand this, and I don't know if they went through it in the book and if they did, I probably didn't cover it. But to just say, this is a required field, that is not a validation summary. A validation summary tells what was wrong with each thing that was in there. That's a validation summary. Not only that, you were told to remove all of the error messages, which meant that even for the, the social security number and for the uh, phone number and for the zip code, there shouldn't have been any error messages there. They should have all been in the validation summary. I decided to be decent with that, or what I considered to be decent, because um, we didn't really go over the intricacies of that in class. 
So I only took off a point. But the point is, no pun intended, I think everybody in the class lost that point. Okay. All right, so where is mine? Hot three load calculator. Okay, gotta find mine. File, open. Desktop. I think this is mine. If I open up one of yours, I'm not trying to do it on purpose, but yeah, this should be mine. And I will tell you, <clears throat> you may or may not agree with this, but in my opinion, this was definitely the hardest, maybe the hardest test that you've taken in all three semesters. Now, you may not agree with that, but when you look at it in total and you look at the, the code that you had to put in to get the thing to work, all right, I think it was. Again, maybe you don't agree with that, which is fine. All right, so for the home page, like I said, to me, this was just a matter of you copying in the stuff from Chapter 9 and making the associated changes. All right, And I'm not going to lie to you on here either. I spent probably two hours on the key. Normally it wouldn't take me that long, but I wrote it and didn't like it, so I went and threw it out and wrote it again. All right, And um, <clears throat> I didn't even put in the... The, the validation summary. So I would have lost all those points on that. All right. But I just wanted you to know that I did, you know, put the asterisk in there, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Mine isn't perfect. Hopefully you, and I, th I think at least everybody utilized what I gave you there for the drop down for the state. And that hopefully, you know, you did and it made sense to you. Now, one thing I did not require this, not only that Brady came up and asked me, he wanted to be sure, but you know what would have made sense? is when you, when you did the submit, all right, I don't know what's going on there, but when you did the submit, if you would have done a redirect to the loan entry page, that just would have made sense, all right? And like I said, I'm, boy, I'm not sure why I got all these errors here, but I just ran it about a little bit ago and it worked just fine. So, but something was goofed up on it, all right. So, like I said, that, that was one thing I thought at least would have made sense. So what was I looking for? Well, I didn't make the, the, the um, code worth as many points as I probably should have. But, you know, in the submit button under your home page, okay, if it was valid, I copied everything over. Now, what a lot of you did was you only copied over the veteran field. But to me, it still made sense to copy over everything. You don't know if eventually you're going to need more things than that. And technically, a loan object was all these things. It wasn't just veteran or not. It was everything. So really, that would have been the right way to do this. All right? And the way that I did it... <clears throat> I mean, a couple of the things that I put in here, like, for, for example, since with the checkboxes, again, there were different ways that you could do this, but I went and was building a little thing that I said, okay, my preferred. Remember, it's possible, although you wouldn't think they'd do it, what if somebody checked all three checkboxes for, for uh, their method that they wanted to be, you know, how they wanted to be get, a hold, get a hold of? You're only supposed to check one, because they, but they were checkboxes. So it would be possible to check none of them or to check any one, any two, or all three. So what I did was I just made three separate if checks. And I said if the, if the email is checked, add that to my preferred. If the phone is checked, add that to my preferred. And if the text is checked, add that to my preferred. And every time I did plus equals, because I have no idea in which order they might check those boxes. All right. What was a little easier was the radio button stuff. And this could be handled in different ways. Some of you handle it like a Boolean field, which was totally fine. All right, so there's a lot of different ways that it could be done. I'm, this bugs the hell out of me that I'm getting this. It says, you know, like I said, I ran this enough times, I never, ever once had a problem with it, but something's always done it. All right, so that was that page. The other thing was, uh, and I'm going to single her out with good things to say, I think, Valerie was the only one on here 
on the thanks page, what I did, and I, if it wasn't you, then just lie and act like it was anyway. Um, I used Font Awesome rather than using their glyphicons, and you should know now how to use Font Awesome because Font Awesome had, uh, they have LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. They have all those glyphicons. So all you really had to do was to go back into the site master and you could use the CDN for Font Awesome. And as soon as you use that, if you click on any of the icons under Font Awesome, if you click on any of them, it shows you the exact code to put in. It, it literally gives you the code. And I thought that was probably an easier way of doing it. Again, you may or may not agree with that, but I thought at least, so if I go back, hopefully there won't be any errors on this page. I can't believe I've got errors like I've got errors. But um, what that allowed you to do, and I made them big, oops, good gosh. Okay, whatever. Um, it allowed you to, to put those actual icons in there. Some of you put in icons. Some of you put in no icon whatsoever. You lost points if you didn't put in an icon. All right? Oh, this is really weird. I'm just wondering why the hell, if I'm even running the right copy or what. All right. Um, if you wanted to get this to work, I think, and, and, and I don't know because a couple of you got it to work, and maybe you didn't do it this way. I don't remember. But I created a class, okay, and not only did I create a class, we didn't have that models folder, okay? You get that models folder that we had in the exercise if when you create the project, you don't create a blank project. You create the forms project because it creates that folder. So I went online. I mean, I was Googling everything you could think of, seriously, when I was doing this. And what Microsoft recommends is if you're building it from scratch, don't make a models folder. Just build, just put it right here. So that's what I did, and all that ends up being is this. Very similar to the one that we did as a class. Okay? And there were different ways that you could set this up. You're all smart enough to know this. Social security number, first name, last name, address, city. No biggies with these, right? Those were, those were text boxes anyway. So that's just going to be a two strength. There's nothing that you special... In fact, you can just use it. There's nothing special you have to do. Zip code, nothing special you have to do. Email, nothing special you have to do. All right. Phone number, nothing special you had to do. The ones we had to worry about were the state, the preferred, and the vet. So those we had to change around a little bit to get those to come in there the way they were supposed to come in. And what was that? Well, if I go over to the loan entry page, all right, and we go over to the C Sharp file. And again, I'm not saying that this is the, the way that I did it was the only way to do it. I'm not saying that at all. All right. Again, this is just unbelievable. That's stuff from the last test, and it's not even working. All right, so I came down here and I said, okay, if that vet was set to yes after you'd already done the monthly payment, I just said monthly payment is now equal to the monthly payment minus 5%. Again, there's so many different ways that could be done. I didn't really care. All right. And then the other stuff was pretty much the same. And then setting the session variables. All right. The clear, again, that I think you had that from before. That should have been pretty self-evident. And the only thing that I didn't show you was the results page. So let's look at that. And that was setting all that stuff up, setting it to null. Okay, this one isn't mine. I can already tell. So let's see if I, I don't even know if I have mine. But uh, anybody have any questions over what I was looking for? All right, I'm going to give them back. You can take a look at them.
So if you disagree and you want to fight for points, you should do that. I don't have any kind of problem with that whatsoever. class, they got their tests back and there were a couple people already that they were trying to fight me over points. And they were like, I hope that doesn't make you mad. It doesn't. I, I mean, I think that if you think you did something right and I disagree, I think you should fight for yourself. I don't think there's a problem with doing that at all. this room who is doing badly in this class, in my opinion, all right? And hopefully, hopefully, the hardest part of the class is already over, all right? You may or may not agree with that as we go into the database stuff, I don't know. So I'm going to pass this out. We are going to go over chapter 13 again as though we hadn't, you know, I gave you that little prelude to it the other day, but we're going to go over it like we haven't done any of it. So we're going to do that, and then we are going to uh, go over these. The good news for you, just so you know, there is absolutely no code we write in either one of these exercises today. We have to change the ASPX files. I'm going to show you how I did it because it's probably not the way that your author does it, and I don't know if you're going to think after I do this, my way is easier or harder. All right. So. You know, as always, you should do it in whatever way makes the most sense to you. Right. <clears throat> All right, so I'm on page 441. Hopefully, if you had any questions from what we covered last time for Chapter 12, hopefully you've already asked them or you will ask them later or whatever. All right. I did not look at all at the stuff that uh, Ms. Zika sent. I did get a message from Dropbox saying that I got about five or six different things from her, but I didn't look at them at all. I hope to do that tonight because I want to get back to her too and let her know that I did get the stuff from her. All right, so what's in this chapter? The first, how the SQL data source works. What the data source is going to allow us to do is once we put it out there and we hook it up to a database, it's going to allow us to bind, our, it's referred to as bind our controls to the database. More than anything else, that's what it does. All right. So when you do this and you walk through the wizard, 
it will create what's called a connection string for you. All right, that connection string can either be saved right in your properties window or what they recommend instead is that you save it to um, your web.config file. So we'll look at that in just a minute. Now, as far as how to configure the select statement, I don't plan on spending too much time on that. We did a lot of that last semester. All right. How to create a where, we'll look at that, but again, in not much depth and breadth of coverage. What we will spend some time on, on 454, is how select parameters work. All right. Now, we talked about this last time. We talked about this before. But the idea behind select parameters is that it allows you to, as the program's running, to make changes and see them immediately reflected. You're going to see that in just a couple minutes. All right. The chapter talks about how to use custom statements and stored procedures. We don't use any in the two chapters. We do go into the data list control in here. All right. It's kind of a different control. And we'll go through that. But things you have to understand. Well, one thing you have to understand is it's this little section in here on 468 to 470, how to use data binding. Because we're going to be using that in every chapter, four, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, directly or indirectly in every chapter. All right. Then they go through the product list application and how to use some more advanced features. So we'll do this. I don't have a clue as to how long it will take, all right? But we will take our time going through it, and when we get done, I've got both the exercises done, so we will do those, all right? Now, the author mentions that back in Chapter 4, you learned the basic of the SQL data source control. You know what? That was so long ago, you may not remember any of it. And they didn't go through a lot of specifics. They said, you know, drag this in, drag this in, choose this, choose this. But now they're going to talk about it in more depth and breadth of coverage as far as what they're doing and why they did it. Every one of you, when you downloaded, all right, when you downloaded um, Visual Studio, you all should have the Microsoft SQL Server Express local database engine. Everyone should have that. Now, I want, I, you know, a couple times this semester, I've tried to do something. We've gone through an exercise or whatever, and I've tried to do something, and it hasn't worked for me. And then you'll raise your hand, oh, work for me, work for me, work for me. That might happen again today. All right, when I did the second exercise, I'm going to show you what I had to do to make it work. You may not have to do this, or you may have to do it. I don't know. Okay. So, first thing that's in there is how the SQL data source control works. This is on the bottom of page 442. And as it says, the next figure will show how it works and it presents the properties. Notice what it says here. In the example in this figure, the data source is bound to a drop-down list. What that means is the drop-down list will be filled rather than it being filled manually by you or me or a for loop or whatever, it's going to now be filled by the database. What you are starting to learn right now are true database-driven websites. That's what we're getting into. All right. So as it says, you can see the select statement. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get through that in just a minute. The connection string... As it says, it provides the information that's needed to connect to the database that contains, in this case, the categories table. All right, so let's look at it, the whole thing. The good news is when you create, when you, when you go and you bring in an SQL data source, when you bring one in and then you hook it up to an existing database, this code that you see right here, not the select statement but the other stuff, that's written for you automatically. You don't have to write that. Okay? There are other things that can go in there and sometimes are put in there. You know what ID is already. You know what run at is already. Okay? The 
provider name that they put in there, it says the default is system.data.sql client, if you look in the chart there. The only way we would not use that is if we were creating the project for Ms. Zika and friends and we were hooking up to their actual server because that, that system.data.sql client, by default, that's our machine. What you may or may not realize is when you download Visual Studio 2015, you get a stripped down version of IIS, which is a Windows server. And your machine is now acting as both the client and as the server. Does that make sense? You're doing both. Now we wouldn't do that if we were doing the, the work again for the uh, St. Charles County Economic Development Center. We wouldn't do that, all right? But for what we're doing, that works just fine. Now, what you have to do is you have to create the select command. And the good news is you know how to do this. We did go over this last semester, and there shouldn't be anything that's in there that surprises you. Notice that by default, we didn't do this. But whether, whether you've got a field like, like um, in fact, every field that's in here is a single, single word but it automatically puts the brackets around it. And I think that's something that they, for lack of better words, stole from Access, because that's how Access does it. It's always been like that. But you should know, looking at this, what are we doing? We're grabbing two fields, right? Category ID and long name. Where are we grabbing it from? From the categories table. What are we doing? We're ordering it by long name, all right? That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in here, all right? And the stuff that's in here under the description, we just went over it. That shouldn't be any surprise either, all right? They do say that an SQL data source can be bound to another control. This is what you're going to see. Now, more often than not, it's going to be bound to a drop-down list. So you can choose from one of a multiple number of options, okay? What we'll get to a little bit, you know, in, in later chapters is you'll have something that kind of looks like this. You'll have a drop-down list, and as an example, what you'll have in here, this might be all of your employees. All right, I don't care if there's one, two, a thousand, but you choose an employee, and then we're going to have another control over here that will give all the information for that employee. Does that make sense? That's the kind of thing that we're building toward. All right, it doesn't have to be that. That could be a department and all the people who worked in that department. There's a lot of different ways that this can be done. This doesn't have to be a drop-down list. It could be a list box. It could be other things. But more often than not, that's what it's going to be. All right. How to choose a data source type on pages 444 and 445. It says here you can also create a... a this by choosing the choose data source command, the smart tag on the bind, yeah, boom, boom, boom. But the bottom line is, well, what do we do? How do we get that data, the data source out there to begin with? We sit and drag it over, right? We drag it over from our toolbox. Remember, this is an invisible control. That said, I was jacking around with it this morning, and since we have Bootstrap now and you've got all these divs and everything else, you should keep it inside of the same div that's going to be using it. Does that make sense? Because I, I didn't do that this morning and it still worked, but then I, I went and looked at the author's key and I thought, why does theirs look a little nicer when you run it than mine does? And, and I noticed that was the only thing they did that I didn't do, so I moved it and then it looked better. It wasn't a real big difference, but I just thought it looked better. All right. So how to choose a data connection? Well, most of the time, this is going to be pretty obvious what you're going to do here. Again, for virtually everything that we do, except possibly, like I said, one of the later chapters in here, we might choose Entity. I don't remember if we do an 18 or not. We're going to choose SQL Database, which is the default, which is the one, like I said, that we're going to choose virtually 100% of the time. So you choose this. This is the one time, and I think I mentioned this to you before, if you decide you want to give that a better name, in the second exercise we're going to do, we have two SQL data sources. 
and I, I didn't change my name for, for either one of them, so they're just SQL Data Source 1 and SQL Data Source 2. Those are not good names. You probably should give them better names than that. All right? But I didn't. But this is, that's when you should give them a different name. You shouldn't go back and change it later. I'm not saying you can't, but the recommendation is that you don't. All right, so after you do that, it's going to come up and it's going to say this. What data connection should your application use to hook onto the database? And if it's the first time, this will be empty. That should make sense to you if you haven't yet hooked it up to a database. So that'll be empty. So you'll click New Connection. If you had two different databases that you wanted to hook up to, and you might have Halloween and another one in there, you could again click New, new Connection, or you could click the down arrow here. When you do all this, and you set it up, so notice here we've selected Halloween.mdf, it builds this for you. All right, this is your, basically this is your connection string that it's building for you. The data source, it says here, equals local DB, MSSQL, local DB. That means your machine. That's what this means right here, your machine. All right, attach DB file name. Well, basically what it's doing is it's going out to your app data and it's follow, finding the Halloween.mdf database. All right. It's telling it the, the security, you know, what you're trying to do is keep it as secure as possible. That's the default. We just leave that. And it says here if it cannot connect within 30 seconds to timeout. If you don't put in something like that, it'll just keep trying and keep trying, and it will try indefinitely. That's why it sets it to 30 for the, for the default value. <clears throat> so as the author mentions underneath that, when you drag the data source control, all right, it's automatically set to database and the first page is that that first page is shown. All right. To use the wizard, you choose the data source type in the smart tag. So in other words, when that comes up and you've got the actual control on there, it'll have that little smart tag, that little arrow that's in the upper right hand corner. You click on that, you choose configure data source, and that's what's going to bring this up. All right. Okay. So, how to create the connection, 446 and 447. We did talk a little bit about this the other day. I want to mention a couple things that are on here again. These are your possibilities, okay? We're never going to be working with access in here, so we would never choose the first one. The second one, you literally, this one right here, you literally can, you can choose that one for anything. Even for an MDF file, it'll work for anything, okay? But ODBC, Open Database Connectivity, should really only be used if you're doing something non-database, like a spreadsheet or a comma-separated variable file or whatever. The next one, M Microsoft SQL Server. So what's the difference between this one and this one? This one here, I think, is the one that we use if we're hooking up to a real server. We're not, at least now, so we choose this one every time. Microsoft SQL Server database file. That's the one you should, you should choose in here always. All right? We're not doing anything with Oracle, and I don't know if the other even gives you anything. The other thing that we didn't talk about last time, if you look right here on the screen, always choose Use Windows Authentication. Because what that says is whatever, you know, if you're logged onto the system, you now have database privileges. If you wanted to add an extra layer of security, you could choose use SQL. So then, even if they were logged on with their Windows account, they'd have to log on again to get into the database. And you see these are grayed out, all this stuff, and it's grayed out because we haven't chosen that radio button option. All right? Again, I'm just hitting the high points here. That's all. And the author did mention on the previous page this is what we're using. So, the, so as he says here, if you're using SQL Server Express Local DB, which is what we're using in the classroom always, says choose Microsoft SQL Server database file. So that's the one we should always be choosing.
Now, when you're going through this, they talk about how to save the, the information to your web.config file. Notice it's just a checkbox on there. So if you click the checkbox right here, it'll save it. And it's again, this is the time if you want to, you can give it a better name. All right. I don't remember what it calls it by default. If it's connection string or something, I don't care. The recommendation is that you always save it to web config. Web config is the that's the configuration file for the entire project. And that's what the author is saying down here. All right, if you save it in web config, the idea is if later, if later you move it from your machine to an actual application server, you should only have to change it in one place right there. That's why that's always the recommendation that you do that. All right. How to configure the select. Again, we've talked about this before. Hopefully you remember this. And I think I mentioned this the other day, but I'm saying it again. Again, I'm trying to be complete here. So if you choose specify columns from a table or view, if you choose this second radio button option right here, then the system is going to expect this has a, this under name here, this has a listing of every table that you have in the database and if you've created views. You may or may not remember a view is a saved query. So you take a query and you give it a name. Those will be shown there too. All right, you can use, e you know, so if you choose specify columns from a table or view and you click this down arrow, it'll show you every table and it will show you every view that you have. If you want to choose everything, you can always put in just click the checkbox with the asterisk here. Notice here we didn't want to. So every time you check something, it's building the query here. It's showing you exactly what it's building right there. All right. If you decide then that instead of doing it this way, you want a custom SQL statement, like maybe a join, all right, or a stored procedure, then you check the first button. If you check the first button, this isn't going to even be you know, available to you. You'll just click next, and it's going to end up showing you the uh, diagram panes that we'll get into in just a bit. Remember, if you're right here and you've chosen these things and you want an order by, you click that button, all right? And it'll allow you to order it. I th it's either one, two, or three. I don't remember how many options that you get. I don't remember, all right? The where, you know what where is. It's if we want to put any criteria in. And the advanced is typically going to be used when you want to open up that pane. So if you want to build everything yourself, you can do it that way, if you've got a more complex query. So this may or may not look confusing, but I wanted to, because we didn't talk about this one at all last time, so I want to show this to you. So what is this saying? This is saying what we want is we want the category ID to be equal to a control the drop-down list. So in other words, we're telling that we want that drop-down list to be able to grab the category ID from the database. All right. Once you put in all this stuff here, and it doesn't show this really in the book, but once it looks like this, you have to click the Add button right here. When you click the Add button, it fills this in that you see right here. All right. So it will fill the whole thing in for you. We're going to do this as a class after the break. So again, these select parameters that they talk about on 452 and 453, I'm sorry, 453 and 450, 454 and 455, select parameters allow you to make your program react at runtime. All right, that's the, the key thing to remember here. And you'll notice there's a bunch of them. You're going to start seeing these when we go through the second exercise in here. And you'll be seeing these more and more as we go on. And I will tell you, you know, maybe you've got an A going in this class and you say, you know what, 
I've never even read a flipping page of this book. I don't know how you can, uh, how you can get rid of, you know, go through this section right here and not read the book. All right. When you start to build this stuff, you're going to notice that a bunch, not all of it, but a bunch of this stuff is going to get filled in for you. And if you look at the select statement that's up there, again, you'll notice that it's got where category ID equals at sign category ID. That's saying, again, where the category ID in the drop-down list is equal to the same category ID in the database. The database driven is implying that what we're doing is we're using our own controls to go into the database and get the information that we want. So there's, I mean, there's a bunch of definitions. I don't feel like reading to you any more than you want to hear me read to you. If you decide you want to build your own custom statement or your own stored procedure, okay? We've talked about this before, that this is what gets built for you automatically, but if you want to put more in there, you can always click the Query Builder. When you click the Query Builder, as you'll see on the next page, it's going to bring you that thing with four different panes in it. If you're doing very simple queries, you don't have to do this. You don't have to click the query builder. You can, it's, it's, you can just choose the, the, uh, the stuff that you want, basically, especially if you're not doing any order by or no wares. When you use this query builder, again, we looked at this the other day. We're seeing it again here. It's got four panes. The first pane that you see right there is the diagram pane. That has a listing of both all the table tables that you have and all of the fields that have been selected. We only have one table in here. It is possible for you to put in as many tables as you want to or need to in here. Choose as many fields as you want. What the system will try to do is let's, you know, I've got products here. If I have categories right here, all right, everybody with me? So if I add the categories table right here and I start bringing in stuff from both tables, when it builds in here, when it builds this for me, it automatically does the join for you. All right, it's trying to do as much work for you as it possibly can. Now, if I if I've got the, the products table in here, like we have, and let's say that the other table I brought in here was states, and there's no nothing linking products and states then it won't build the join because there's no there's no there's nothing to join on. All right? So it's smart, but it's only as smart as the smarts you give it, for lack of better words. All right? So that's the diagram pane. The grid pane shows every single one of the fields that you've selected. And you'll notice, because this is kind of an important point, just so you see it, you'll notice in here we've got product ID and we've got name as an example. All right? And you'll notice that unit price and on hand are also checked. That means they're down here someplace. If for some reason we decide, let's just say we didn't want the product ID, we wanted it as part of the query, but we didn't want it to actually print, just uncheck that. All right. Every field that's checked is going to print in the output. So if I uncheck it, it's still part of the query, but it just won't print. Then we've got the SQL pane. So based on what you chose up here, it's going to build the SQL for you. And then you've got the results pane. So when that will show when you run the query. All right, it'll show you all of your results. And I think I said this last time, you can take your mouse and put it on any of the gray areas in between. Make any of these bigger or smaller as you want to. So again, if that wasn't enough for you, you want more of an explanation, they do, they do a better job than I do on the bottom of page 459. Next, they talk about how to define the parameters. It says if you specify one or more parameters when you create a select statement with a query builder, the next dialog box lets you define those parameters. Again, you're saying that as the program is running, I want to be able to change something. Again, typically that means I want to be able to, ch to check a different value in the drop-down list. In the second example that we're going to do after the break, what you'll see is going to happen in here is we'll have a drop-down list of states. And as you choose a state, 
it's going to show you all the customers related to that state. So if it's Missouri, it's going to show me all the Missouri customers. If I change to Illinois, it'll be all the Illinois customers, et cetera. We're going to run through that again after the break. So they say in the example they showed here, the source of the category ID parameter is set to the selected value of the control DDL category. All right. You've got your choice when you set this stuff up. Some of it you can set in here. Some of it you can set in the properties window. Some of it you can just type in. All right. It's always up to you. I, I tend to, as I've been going on here, to just type more and more stuff in. You may, not, may or may not be comfortable doing that. All right. But again, I'm going to show you when we do this, these exercises as a, as a class how I did it. All right, then starting on 462, how to use the data control. And I'll, let's, let's go through this. It's about the next four or five pages. Then before we go into data binding, we'll take a break. All right, the data list, this is a pretty ugly data list right here. It is. You know, it just looks like you kind of slop some stuff up there because that pretty much is what they did. All right, but a data list control displays items from a repeating data source. So in other words, it can give you the equivalent of a table. All right. So it says in the topics that follow, you'll learn how the data list control works. You'll learn how to create the templates and you'll learn how to format a data list control. Well, when you look, <clears throat> it's got, yeah, it's got an ID. It's got a run at it, et cetera. It's got that, but it's got more to it because you work with templates. Okay. We're going to look at these templates, but what I did was rather than having to, to, to work with the templates, I knew the kind of code that was going to go in there. So I just wrote the code directly in my .aspx page because I don't like working with this. All right. If you like working with it, then you can take a look at what's in the book and you can do it that way. But again, a data list displays a list of items from the data source that it's bound to. Okay. You create one or more templates in order to be able to do this. To display the data from a column in a data source, you add a control to a template, and then you bind that control. Again, we'll look at binding in just a bit. You can use a data list control to edit as well as display. But what we'll get to in later chapters is there's a data list, there's a grid view, there's a details view, there's a forms view, and there's a list view. There's five basic types of ways that you can look at the data. Some of them allow you to only um, look, to look at data, just look at it, not change it. Some of, you, some of them allow you to do some of those operations. Some of those allow you to do all of those operations. And that's what we're going to get to in the next several chapters. All right. So again, this is 464 and 465, how to define the templates for a data list. The templates basically specify the content you want to display and the associated controls. What you're going to see here, what we're going to do after the break when we do the second exercise, is we will define a header template and we'll define an item template. Those two. You can do all these. So if we wanted, for example, notice the alternating item template. If you wanted to do zebra striping, we could do that. We're not asked to do that yet, okay? And the separator, as it says, displayed between items, a separator template, if you had something that you wanted between items, even a, a line or whatever, you could do that. But the ones that we're most concerned with right now are the header template, because the header template is like a label. And then the item template, which is the data that goes with that label. That makes sense? That's what we're most concerned with right now. The other stuff is kind of window dressing, and it's ways that you can, you can, you can use and, and I don't know, um, make it more aesthetically pleasing, for lack of better, something better to say. All right, so as they mention here, the templates that you define specify the content to display and the associated controls. To create a template, you, you choose Edit Templates from the Smart Tag menu for the control. All right, or you just type it in directly. To add text, click in the template and begin typing. So I'm not going to do it the exact way that they show it here, just so you know that. All right, I'm going to do it 
by literally just typing the information in. You may disagree with the way I'm doing it, especially when it comes to things like this. Because as they show here on 467, when you come in and you want to be able to, to modify, you want to be able to format, you want to say, oh, that's a currency field. It's easier to do it the way they're showing it than the way I'm doing. So he said, fine, Jeff, then why are you doing it that way? Just because I do it that way? I don't know. All right. I just find that way easier. You may or may not agree with that. So again, this is a little bit more klutzy, for lack of better words, than the way it used to be. Because now with all the bootstrap stuff in there, they mention in the description here, it says, because a data list is rendered as a table, you can use the bootstrap classes for working with a table to format the data list. You can also format it by applying a predefined scheme by using the properties box. That's what they have here. All right. To apply a scheme, choose auto format if you want to. So there's different ways that this can be done. Bottom line. All right. So we've got about, I don't know, not too much more in here. We've got about eight or ten more pages. So let's take a break. It's 133. Let's come back around. Let's make it 150, a healthy break. And at 150, we'll finish up the chapter. Once we finish up the chapter, we will, uh, we will go through and do the exercises. All right.